received by the clerk in writing. So uh, if required, we will take a break at around 10.30. So at this time, I ask that uh, Council approves the agenda, Session 2-2020, as circulated. And is there any additions, uh, deletions, concerns? There are some items uh, on desk for the delegation under the uh, site alteration bylaw. So for your information. So if I could have a mover, moved by Nix and seconded by Creelman. Any discussion? All in favor? It carries. And uh, we need to approve the previous minutes. Uh, so the motion is that Council approves the minutes of session 1-2020 as circulated. And could have moved move by Mantelo and seconded by Martin. Any discussion? All in favor? That carries. And so at this brief interlude, we have a special presentation to do, and I get to come out in front so that so that this can be um, videotaped, and uh, it's for our great enjoyment that we have a long-time service award presented to Mark Early. She'd like to come forward, Mark. And this is um, a certificate to say in grateful appreciation of your service and commitment to the town of Mono from 1990 to 2020, and signed by me. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, very quickly, I know you guys are busy. Um, I almost didn't get here. I, I'm sure council doesn't know. I left 4.30 in Orangeville uh, for a job closing that closed at 5 up here. And I hummed and hawed about uh, uh, coming to the town and what a life-changing decision it's been. So This was not this morning. This was, <laughs> this was in the fall of 1989. And uh, dropping it off with Keith and the, the, the office looked a lot different. So... Um, in uh, thanks, Sharon. I, I'm, I'll get to that. Uh, in in 30 years, I've seen a lot of changes. Uh, the town did not have internet. The town did not have email at that time. Uh, I had no kids, but I did have a full head of hair. So, <laughs> so there you go, Sharon. Uh, just uh, so I sincerely like to thank all the councils over the years that allowed me to nurture a very rewarding, rewarding career in municipal administration here at the town. Uh, tallying it up to date and. Uh, Mr. Wilker said this is quite impressive, by the way. Ten councils, three reeves, four mayors, and 22 different councillors over the years. Um, secondly, I'd like to thank all of the staff here at the town, uh, both past and present, that have worked as a cohesive team to rise to council's challenges and to beat the demands of our residents. The respectful relationship which has existed between council and staff over the last 30 years has made the town of Mono not only an envious place to be employed, but has created a reputation for Mono as a cutting edge, progressive, environmental municipality willing to go beyond our required mandates and do that little extra to make a difference in the community. I've been proud to be along for the ride. Thank you. Questions from any member in the gallery that we could pose to council? Please come forward, state your name and address, and pose your question. Seeing none. Okay. Uh, under delegations, we do have a presentation uh, scheduled for 9:15. Uh, I'm not sure if. Well, you are here. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so Joanne Jordan, Family Transition Place. So if you please like to come forward. Thank you. Yeah, just push the button and perfect. I got it. Thank you. Uh, yes, I am Joanne from Family Transition Place. I've been working 
in the shelter there for the past 10 years now. And um, uh, three years ago, oh, do I press the middle button? There we go. 2016, so over three years ago now, we um, were funded for a rural response program through the ministry. And it was actually a three-year funding. So we, we, it was kind of a pop-up thing. Um, however, this past spring, so a year ago now, we were able to get ongoing continued funding. And um, so we want people to know not only has it been out the past three years, and I'll tell you about it, but that we will be continuing. So we definitely want the word out um, in rural, rural Dufferin overall, um, but Dufferin as a whole. So the goals of the Rural Response Program is to provide support to women in crisis within Dufferin County, specifically North Dufferin, because of the barriers that some of these women um, experience. Uh, transportation, just being isolated, child care is an issue all around and we can work with that, and access to after hour service. So the Rural Response Program provides a crisis response strategy for responding to rural needs. So whatever they, the counselors are hearing about, whatever the issues are, they do try to work with that, and it's very flexible. And of course, we want to increase collaboration, presence, and awareness across existing services and community members such as you. So this... Uh, can be updated as of a week or two ago. We are still in the Mel Lloyd Center, which is an excellent position to be, um, it, but we're at entrance A now. So for anybody who's been up there, it's the big you know, A-frame window right at the front of the building, um, not entrance C. But if you go to entrance C, they'll redirect you, I'm sure. Um, able to be mobile is really the crucial piece of this program, so meeting with women in the community and using technology. So. Women, uh, especially in rural Dufferin, don't need to feel like they will have to figure out how to get to Orangeville. We can help with that regardless. Um, if they need to come to Orangeville and come to the shelter or access services in Orangeville. But we do have this location in Shelburne. We can also assist with people coming to that location. But uh, in reality, the, the point is um, the counselors that we have can go out and meet in the community and wherever the woman is most comfortable. Um, whether it's, you know, in their own home or maybe at the doctor's office or at their church or a friend's house or whatever is going to work for them and is going to be the safest thing for them, we can meet with them there. Offer abuse education and support, providing safety planning regardless of what um, their choices are within the options that they feel they have. How are they going to be safe, safest using those um, when they go the, that route, whatever option they want. It does allow for up to six crisis counseling sessions, and longer-term counseling is available at the Mel Lloyd Center. That is also flexible, though, so those six counseling sessions are not necessarily locked down. It's, you know, however the needs are going to um, direct. And always we will direct to appropriate community referrals as needed, so if they need to maybe access Ontario Works, if they need to get a hold of Dufferin Child and Family Services, um, needing the police, or needing the doctor, um, needing an alternate um, service of any sort, we can provide those referrals and assist them with accessing them. So we do want to create awareness in the community of violence against women issues, increase awareness about the agency's available services. So we do also not just have the shelter in Orangeville, which is what most people think about, but we have available to anybody who needs it, legal and transitional or housing support. Um, addictions counseling is available, mental health counseling and support and one-to-one -one clinical counseling, and that's for people, whether they are in the shelter or not in the shelter, and whether they come to Orangeville or Shelburne or use this rural response program. Providing crisis support and brief counseling. We will uh, support counseling to men only um, if they're identifying with sexual abuse. We can assist with that otherwise we would again make a referral out to them that's going to be 
the best support to that male who may call us seeking support. If we can't help them, we'll refer them out. Um, we can also utilize OTN, which is the Ontario Telehealth Network. It's, um, it's like a FaceTime, but it's very secure. It's because it's through the ministry. Um, so it's not going to get out there and somebody's going to grab the, the data or the information. Uh, and PCVC is the same thing, but just on a personal computer. And texting is very, very common now. We have uh, cell phones throughout the agency that um, we use to text with our clients. A lot of times we were finding they didn't have minutes on their phone. They, uh, that was a huge thing. They, you know, month to month, they weren't being able to pay for more minutes and we weren't, they couldn't get a hold of us if they needed to and we couldn't get a hold of them. So texting is, is much better. Um, so that's used a lot. Advocacy, um, partnering with other frontline community services. So that one piece of that is, uh, well, the walk-in clinic that's up in Shelburne now. That's a new piece. Um, it's also only a number of weeks old, a couple months now. So there's two doctors available in Shelburne um, for walking in, and decaps is there, and we have a counselor there as well. Wednesdays three to seven. So. <clears throat> particularly people in Shelburne um, that can utilize that so we want them to know but that's also out there um, but as far as um, the early on also being located in the Meloid Center that's been really helpful with child care because they have allotted us some hours throughout the the days and the weeks that if somebody comes in and they want counseling but they have their kids at home and they they need child care well they get that support the early on can work that in to their schedule or we work it into the early on schedule and and that woman can come in still bring her children and have them in child care while she's talking to us And this is how you can contact us. We've got two crisis counselors out. When uh, we first started the program three years ago, Samantha was the one who rolled it out. Um, she actually went off on maternity leave, and Andrea Chantry was able to fill in for her during that time. But now that Samantha's back, we have this extra funding, and we're able to keep both of them, which is really, really great. And again, we want everybody to know that we have two people out there and that if they need support, it's going to be available to them. We will, we will do our best to come and make sure that rural women have access to the supports they may need. Excuse me. And are there any questions? Okay. Yes. Councillor Nix. I, I had two. Is that okay? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be curious just to get some idea of the scope of this uh, program. Like, I don't know what what would you call them? How many people a year? How many clients? Or like, how? I, give me some idea of how many people you deal with in a year in this rural response program. That is a really, is a really good question, um, and I. I myself don't have those numbers. I know we absolutely have them available. I should probably have them with me. I've never been asked that yet. Um, I, I mean, are we talking several dozen or several hundred or a thousand? I mean, what? Um, okay, 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 I'll go on to my second question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to think of uh, when I, I hear the, the ladies talking about their lists and who's on uh, as far as their clients. Um, I, I actually don't want to bulk maybe 20, 40. I don't really want to put a number on it because I, I literally don't know. It, but it's not hundreds at the moment, um, which is a good thing. I, I'm glad to hear that in a way. However, I do definitely, we all know that there are more women out there, and we, we, this is why we want to make them aware of the program. So I do expect as the um, program, the word gets out a little more, there, it will be a bigger list. Um, it is... The, the girls are busy right now, um, but they're not run off their feet, which is really good. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things, as you know, the numbers that are out there are never the true expected numbers. Second question, if that's okay, is I'm impressed when I, I hear your presentation and the, the, whatever the number of people you deal with, there's a lot of referral to other agencies, whether it's the police, doctors, or whatever. And I, I get the same story from uh, Heather at the food bank where a lot of their clients, which I think is over 500, and, and they're constantly having to, I don't know whether it's psychiatric or drug related or police or whatever it is. About, let's say 10 years ago, I, and I'm, I can't remember the timing, there, there was a, an effort in Dufferin 
it was an umbrella group. I forget what the name of it was, but they even had an executive director because uh, did we have a presentation here at council or, or some some place? I, I I listened to it and it included everybody, mm -hmm. all the agencies, Salvation Army, the Food Bank, everybody, mm -hmm. and I thought that made a lot of sense because there is a lot of um, movement back and forth between all these agencies. Yep. But it collapsed, I think, or I've never heard of it since. It just seems to have disappeared. Do you, do you know anything about that? There may have been, it may be the housing one you, that you're talking about. I know there was a, a group of all the agencies. They do, the agencies, for different reasons, do in fact meet together quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And okay. um, for, different, for different reasons. Um, but there was definitely a housing group um, I'm not sure it collapsed. I wasn't part of the group, but uh, I would hear about it under FTP because because we were part of it. Um, the big one right now, and actually there's kind of two, so it may it may morph a little bit, um, is the situation table in Orangeville. Um, the situation table does have um, Deaf and Child and Family Services, Family Transition Place, uh, Orangeville Police, um, OPP. Uh, so who organizes that? I mean, what, what CMHA, I, I do want to add that in, and I'm not too sure how, who I'm missing. Uh, if, I'm not sure how it was initiated. Um, it's it's a regular thing now. They meet every Tuesday morning, actually, so they're meeting now. And it, what it is is it is based around t typically mental health. Um, so and it's it's often Orangeville police that see <laughs> that get these calls to some of the mental health situations, but it could be anybody. It could be CMHA. It could be you know DCAPS. It could be FTP. It could it, it, these are why they're all at the table. Um, and so they would come and and they would present a situation, an unnamed situation, and it does go through levels and filters um, to to keep that anonymity of that person and through just the discussion that that they have, they can sort of tease out, okay, now which um, members should really come and address this situation. So if there's no children, obviously DCAPs can back out, you know, things like that. Um, and that, that is ongoing. There is now, CMHA has just, just um, began a program. It, I'm not sure how long, because it is funded as well, so I'm not, yes, the Canadian Mental Health Association. <laughs> Yeah, um, not sure how long it's going to run. It, it it's also a pocket of funding. So, but something very very similar is what CMHA is working on right now, and that's day to day rather than week to week. So every day, twice a day at this moment, and this is only uh, maybe it's second week I think or third um, that it's really been up and running. So it's developing, <laughs> but um, twice a day in the morning and in the afternoon they do a, a group phone call and again any situations that need to be discussed um, through the members that participate and it is uh, Family Transition Place, it's Canadian Mental Health Association, it's um, SHIP which is Supportive Housing in Peel, um, not the hospital is involved, um, again a lot of the members. So there is a lot of community work uh, and, and FTP is always happy to be involved in the center of that. Um, again, it, these are mostly out of Orangeville, but it's not excluding Dufferin on the whole. It just, Orangeville's very, you know, clustered. So, yeah. So there there are things out there, yep. Yeah. It's sort of all part and parcel of the Headwaters Community in Action Group. Is it part of it? Yeah. Oh, okay. And um, there's also the um, movement right now in terms of uh, solving homelessness in the community, so that's bringing in new uh, information and also poverty reduction. So they're all working together, and that comes under the DC Moves oh, right. department in the county. So mm -hmm. it's a it's a really good network. Good. And Wellington Dufferin Public Health is involved in that also. So, yeah. so Ralph? Thank you for coming and presenting this to us. Uh, I'm familiar with women's shelters as my wife worked as a director in one in Etobicoke for about 10 years. Um, I think the work you do is unfortunate that it has to be done, but it's a, it's a marvelous um, uh, organization. Um, I wasn't aware of this rural outreach program, so I have two questions. One is, um, on the slides, uh, you say that the goal is to uh, reduce barriers for under service to women in, uh, living in North Dufferin. Yep. Just, uh, does, does that include Mono? And, uh, Yes, yeah, yeah, it is. Um, really, all of Dufferin. 
Really, yeah. Well, I mean, north of Orangeville, there is, of course, East Garfraxa. Um, okay. I just wondered if we were included or not. It would be. It is really all of Dufferin. Oh, I mean, this is why I'm here. Yes, of okay. course. Um, it is all of Dufferin. There, uh, like, there are certain places where it's, do you want to go to Shelburne, or do you want us to come to you, or would Orangeville work better for you? So it's just kind of one of those things where even through that initial phone call, um, we would sort of assess the situation and make referrals and and things can change as well. I mean, you're not locked in if you go to Orangeville and if that's not working, something else might be better for you, that can be discussed. My, my second question is, uh, is how do you um, get the word out there? How do you, you let women know that this is available? Me. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> um, we do have posters now around, um, again, fairly new. The word had been leaking. Um, Samantha herself had done a lot of um, a lot of this community engagement piece when it first began, as well as dealing with the clients that she then acquired. Um, we know about it in Family Transition Place, so of course any phone calls that we get would be sort of triaged out, and and some of our really close partners also are aware and would hopefully you know, make that referral as well. But this is what I'm definitely doing. I'm trying to get out and, and get the word out. So between posters and word of mouth and meeting with groups and, you know, whatever we, I, we can think of to do, we, we do want the word out so that it's saturated out in the community. Thanks very much. Thank you. Sir? Thank you for your presentation today. Um, as I was listening to the various organization names, one occurred to me, and I, I wanted your response uh, uh, as to uh, how effective you think they are, whether they're sufficiently uh, supported uh, by the province, and that's the uh, um, uh, the uh, Victim Witness Assistance Program, which is run out of most courthouses. Yes. And I would take it that you would have some interaction with those folks, and they may even be a, a source of, of referrals to you. Uh, what's your experience with uh, the office in Orangeville? My personal experience is extremely limited, so I can't really speak too much to it. I do know there are referrals back and forth. Um, I don't know, uh, you know, about their funding. I mean, that would be them, and I, I couldn't really speak to it. Um, I know that we, like, from our end, we will tend to refer out to them for some some specific things that they are funded for. Um, some pockets of money that we know women can maybe access through them for you know maybe changing their locks or getting alarms in their house that would be something that they would do that we're aware of that they have that capacity um, <clears throat> we do have court support workers we've got our, our legal support and even the transitional support our housing support worker they're interchangeable so they're very familiar with each other's roles and they really have a much closer relationship because they're in the court, they're hands-on, they, they deal with them. So it's, a lot of what I know is just kind of hearsay from being one step back from that. Um, you, you do wonderful work insofar as the, uh, the, the court uh, liaison <coughs> is concerned and, and uh, frankly the, um, uh, the victim witness assistance program uh, is, is a little un underutilized and unknown gem yeah. and I'm hope hoping that they are uh, not under uh, financial pressures such as uh, the legal aid system is currently experiencing. Yeah, I, I really can't speak to that. I'm, <laughs> I'm sure everybody is underfunded, so that would just be a blanket statement. Um, but yeah, I really can't speak to that. I do, I do know that we still are referring women to them for certain things, and they are still able to help them. But I, I don't know what their struggles are at their end and, you know, what they're not able to help with. But, yeah, it's always tight, right? So, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Joanne, for being here today. Um, I have to say that um, I was involved before FTP had a name. Oh. So at the birth. And... Um, to see what's happening now and the interconnections, because that wasn't there to begin with, no. for sure. Everybody right. had their little area, and uh, I'm just thrilled to see the amount of cooperation. The outreach program is uh, quite amazing, and I'm 
very proud of FTP. Thank you for coming. Thank you, and really thank you for everything that you all started. I know we still have Do some people that are still there, and you probably have seen their names or hear them and, and know who they are. And yeah. um, I, For them, it's I, you, they say the same thing. It's really been great. Yeah. So Absolutely amazing. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for your work. So thank you very much, okay. Joanne, for taking the time to explain the processes, and uh, we certainly support all the work that you're doing, and uh, it's uh, unfortunate, as Councillor Mankelow said, that we even have to have that in our community, but at least we know that there's a large group of, of support for the women that are in crisis. So. Thank you very much for having me and for your questions, and I hope I was able to shed some light. No, thank you very great. much. Thank okay. you. Okay, now we have our um, site alteration bylaw exemption request. It's scheduled for 9.30, but we've got, so we, I think we're close enough. It's 9.26, <laughs> so, so if we get started. Uh, so I guess I'll ask um, Mr. Trotman if you want to start us off with this. Thank you, Mayor Ryan. Um, so this uh, application came before um, planning committee Planning and Environmental Natural Heritage Committee um, this past Tuesday. Um, it's an application for um, about 22,000 cubic meters um, of environmentally clean fill on the Ritchie property at 833231 Fourth Line for the construction of a personal use horse training track, exercise track. Um, there was some attendance at the meeting. There was a lot of dialogue and commentary. Um, the applicant's consultant, G2S, was there, as well as the, uh, the contractor, um, Mr. Steve Martin. And um, a lot of the questions focused around, you know, road degradation, um, dust, noise, um, length for which a, the actual filling operation would occur. Uh, contingency matters, that sort of thing. Uh, these are all cited in a revised FMP film management plan. So the original plan was vetted by our good town engineer, engineer here, Mr. Jim Walls, and there were changes and revisions made to that FMP, and it was a revised copy that came before committee. Um, there were other queries about um, the amount of fill needed, whether there could be a no-fill or minimum fill option as an alternative to the proposal. And um, there was also questions about the, uh, the small woodland on site, uh, whether it met or triggers under the official plan for a natural heritage evaluation test or EIS, environmental impact study. Um, the applicant has provided through a subconsultant, GEM, a comment on that. It's a hard copy letter I gave you this morning before we commenced. Um, but I think at this point, um, it's probably incumbent upon the applicant's consultant to address um, the commentary that came out of committee, um, which they did and cited in, a, in an email uh, for, I think it was about six items there. So I believe they're here tonight, or today, excuse me, <laughs> this morning. So uh, if Stephanie, Stephanie, are you here? There you are. Okay. So you can make your presentation, and then we can take questions from council as if, if required. Good morning, my name is Stephanie Lewis and I work for G2S Environmental Consulting. I would like to provide a brief overview of the film management plan that was created for the residential and agricultural property located at 833-231-4th Line in Mono. Mr. and Mrs. Ritchie own standard bred horses and would like to exercise them on their property. Approximately 22,000 cubic meters of clean fill would be placed on the southern portion of the site to raise the current surface grades. The design process took into consideration the minimum amount of fill required while creating a safe track to exercise horses. The fill management plan sets out three main objectives. 
The first objective is to ensure that imported fill meets the applicable Ministry of the Environment, Conservation, and Parks Table 2 site condition standards, which are specifically applicable to the site as it applies to agricultural property use in potable groundwater conditions. The second objective included the development of risk management measures to prevent the occurrence of unacceptable risks. And the third objective is to develop risk management protocols in the event that an unacceptable risk were to occur. To meet the objectives one and two, the quality of soil from the potential source site is vetted through a rigorous process in which includes a peer review of existing environmental reports for the source site. Such environmental reports include a phase one environmental site assessment, which would examine the current historic use of the site and surrounding properties. A phase two environmental assessment would include results of soil and groundwater investigations and include <coughs> chemical analysis reports. Each source site would provide analytical reports showing that the soil has been adequately characterized prior to being imported on site. It's important to note that if the soil at the source site exceeded the Ministry Table 2 site condition standards for agricultural property use, it would not be received on site. If the source site does not have the proper analytical, a qualified professional is to prepare a sampling program to adequately characterize the soil that is to be exported to the site. In regards to on-site accountability, to further address the objectives one and two, on-site soil quality accountability measures include on-site sampling every 30 days. The area of infilling will be divided into evenly spaced sampling grids and samples will be collected and screened for environmental impacts. Based on visual observations and screening measurements for total organic vapors, a minimum of two samples will be submitted for chemical analysis and analyzed for various parameters as outlined in the <coughs> FMP. A constant daily visual inspection will be completed in the area of the site currently being filled. Accountability will also be addressed on site through record keeping and reporting. This is addressed in section five of the fill management plan and outlines that the site operator will maintain a plan and record showing the date, the areas of the site being filled, the source of the fill material being imported, the volume and the date of the arrival of the load to the site. The records will be held on site and are available for review anytime by town staff. Risk management protocols in the event that an unacceptable risk would occur are addressed in sections 4.9 and 4.10 in the fill management plan. If impacted soil is identified on site, the town will be notified within 24 hours. To confirm the presence of impacted soil, a minimum of two soil samples will be collected at the same depth within a two meter radius of the identified exceedance. An average of, average of the sampling results will confirm if the soil meets the applicable site condition standards as per section 48, subsection two of Ontario regulation 150.304. The area being investigated will um, be immediately fenced off while confirmed impacts are delineated and excavated and a detailed report will be provided to the town. Complaint procedures are addressed in section, section six of the fill management plan. All complaints are addressed in a timely manner and are communicated with the appropriate department at the town. Documentation of the complaint, actions, and resolution will be provided to the town and kept on site. Operations will cease if necessary. We would like to address several concerns that were voiced by local residents. Several, several members of the community were concerned about the impact the site activities would have on local road conditions. On-site management measures such as granular mud mats will be in place and maintained to prevent mud tracking onto fourth line. Truck traffic was also a concern and will be managed on-site to prevent queuing on fourth line. The trucks will be scheduled as to avoid school bus loading and drop off times and higher commute volume periods during the day. Fourth line will be inspected twice a day and a road maintenance deposit will be provided to the town. Potential noise concerns were also voiced. As per section 4.3.2 of the fill management plan, the site will operate in compliance with the town's noise bylaw. Excessive tail gate banging will be prohibited and enforced on site. Excessive dust concerns are addressed in the fill management plan in section 4.3.3. A water flushing truck and sweeper truck will be mobilized to the site and dust suppressants will be applied if required. A cleaning log shall be recorded and maintained by on-site representatives and will be available for review. 
As residents living in the area rely on potable wells, impacts to the groundwater quality were a concern. On and off-site accountability measures, to which I previously spoke, are in place to ensure that only fill meeting the Table 2 site condition standards is brought to the site. And this will be confirmed via on-site audits and continuous, continuous visual inspections. By meeting the applicable ministry standards for the site, contaminants will not be introduced and the drinking wells will not be impacted. Erosion and drainage patterns were also concerns to the residents and they're addressed via on-site silt fence along the southern property line. The infiltration and drainage patterns are not expected to be impacted based on the permeability of the soil and the large area of infiltration that remains in the center of the track. Interior and exterior fill cuts will be seeded with grass and spruce trees to mitigate erosion. Invasive species such as rag mites will be managed by limiting the importation of topsoil to within 200 kilometers radius of the site. It is important to note that the Ritchie family utilizes the potable well on site for their house and horses. All measures are in place to ensure that the short-term project will not negatively impact the owners, their families, residents within the community, and the environment in which we all depend. Thank you. Any questions from council regarding the report? Thanks, Councillor Nix. Well, I'm not sure I have a question for the consultant, but I wanted to ask uh, David. I mean, I read the, all the application and the correspondence, and that was fine. And then I think yesterday we got this email from uh, G2S Environmental Consulting responding to some of the issues raised at the public meeting. Now, I've, I've tried to absorb it. Uh, I mean, I've read it. Uh, I, I guess what I'd like to know from someone who's more into this than I, did, did this email, which responded to some of the issues, did, does it satisfy all the issues raised at the public meeting? And in particular, I, I, I'm going on memory here, but I know our, our engineering firm <laughs> had suggested or recommended that the permit conditions be detailed and made public prior to the public meeting. And I, I, it, all, all it says in this e the email I got yesterday is that it is our understanding that the town will draft the permit conditions. Has that been done? Or are we in a position to make a decision on this unless or until we get those permit conditions? There were, uh, so G2S did respond to the, I think it was six items that were addressed in that email. Um, you have the hard copy addressing item six. Um, there's compliance matters that were considered at the planning committee meeting that the committee felt needed further detail. Um, and then, of course, there's the question of the permit conditions or the draft conditions. So, I mean, these would be the body of items required as part of a, an agreement. So I, I think I'm going to get Mr. Walls to speak to those matters. Uh, he's more able to do that as our town engineer. Good morning. I, I'm Jim Walls of RJ Burnside. Uh, we're the town engineers. I'm a qualified person under OREG 15304 uh, to deal with uh, 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 fill and, uh, and these type of matters. Um, the, the permit conditions that I was talking about, it was a little bit misunderstood. Uh, they had already been <coughs> addressed in conversations with Mike Dunmore regarding roads and a, and a memo that he wrote regarding the requirements for the roads. So the permit conditions are something that the town would put an outline on the on the permit. One of the conditions would be that full adherence to the uh, fill management plan, um, the road uh, occupancy permit requirements, the deposits required, the fee schedule, um, a security deposit that the town would uh, require uh, for, for filling, uh, those kind of items. So it was a, a little bit of a misunderstanding that they hadn't been done. They had been done and the town and myself had uh, talked about what they would be and how they would be drafted. So we're, we're comfortable that we have uh, those things in place and it would just be a matter of the legalese that is up, uh, put into the actual uh, agreement document. You handed us this letter from Jim's. Oh, okay, no. They're, they're a groundwater environmental management service company. And I, who are they? Re they're responding to, to you, right? They address this uh, attention to Stephanie Lewis, right? Just in a word, wh wh what's this letter say? Does this, it say le this letter satisfied? addresses 
this letter addresses the item six about whether or not the, uh, the small woodland feature on the Ritchie property should undergo an environmental impact study or hydrological evaluation uh, because of the proximity of the proposed horse track and, and the fill that's required to construct that track. Um, and they're so saying that there are weighed in on you know what are uh, some of the, the key pol or the policies there speaking to this matter under the green belt plan and then of course relative to section 14 our natural heritage policies in the official plan um, so we've we've identified the woodland as you know it has local significance what this gem letter says well it's not provincially significant and they comb through the test required under the green belt plan and speak to the various policies of Section 14 to say, well, at the end of the day, it doesn't need an EIS, and they've cited reasons in there why. I don't know if Mr. Walls wants to speak further to it or not, but uh, I, uh, I've uh, re reviewed the uh, the comments made by GEMS, and uh, I, I agree with their perspective. <laughs> and one thing to keep in mind: it's perfectly legal for the applicant to go out and uh, put a whole that whole field into corn. And once you've done that, there are no uh, concerns with natural heritage. It's a cornfield. And then he could uh, convert it the very next day into the track, which is all uh, ap applicable under the, uh, the agricultural uh, nature of this property. So uh, there's, no, there's no value in doing a, a, a natural heritage assessment of, of that portion of the property. Going back to the um, the um, Planning and Environmental Natural Heritage Committee's recommendations, and they they give reasons for denying uh, at the present time pending some additional information. Have we now got all the additional information they outlined in their report to us? Yeah, I think so. I think the gem letter identifies a response to that required to that comment. 